Okay, I'll call this meeting to order. Um, our invocation today is being given by <coughs> Pastor Bill Lasasso from New Path Community Church in Lailman. Please stand and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance by Commissioner uh, Peters. Father, thank you for this amazing county in which we live. It's beautiful, it's everything good, but it's a whole lot of work. And what we're asking today is you would give these commissioners wisdom beyond anything and peace and have a great meeting. You know, God, what we'd like is that we could say at the end of this day that our county was in better shape after this meeting than it was before. You can help us do it, and we're asking. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. I feel like I'm in the legislature now. <laughs> it's a throwback, wow. Watch out behind you. Okay. Watch out behind you. Okay, I'm going to pull my chair in. <laughs> Thank you. Burritos. I'd like to ask our friend from the uh, Tampa Bay Times, Jody Push Pushkin. She's the manager of the Newspapers and Education Program. And we're going to, we have a proclamation here. Thanks for being here. All right, Newspaper and Education Week is an initiative of the American Press Institute, which recognizes the accomplishments of newspaper and education programs around the country and around the world. It is an international program that encourages the use of the daily newspaper as a living textbook for students from primary grades through adult education levels. Research tells us that the best way to teach children, to help, to help children discover the, law, the joy of reading, I guess my eyes aren't as good as I thought, and become lifelong readers is to involve them early and often. Students who learn using the newspapers as an educational resource are more likely to become lasting readers and informed and engaged citizens. Helping a child to learn to love reading improves their chances for success in school and beyond. The Tampa Bay Times Newspaper and Education Program has served Tampa Bay educators, students, and families by providing print and digital newspapers, award-winning education publications, teacher guides, lesson plans, educator workshops, and many more resources, at, all at no cost to teachers or families. Or schools. Tampa Bay Times for more than 40 years has participated in newspapers and education. In 2018-19, the Times has served 565 teachers, 140,659 students, and 170 schools in Pinellas County. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that the week of March 2nd to 6th, 2020, be recognized as New Newspaper in Education Week 2020. Thank you. I know you have something to say. Um, I just want to thank you for your partnership and for the partnership uh, with Pinellas County and Pinellas County Schools. Um, I have the same numbers you do, so that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> oh. Well, that's probably where we got them, actually. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much for for doing this for our school system. I do think it's important, and I think our daily newspaper is important. So please, support your daily newspaper. Yes, I do. And we have the He oh fooled you. Uh, <laughs> and for our partner presentation, I'd like to call up Angeline Scoton, a biological scientist in the Division of Habitat and Species Conservation with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Thank you so much for being here. 
Okay. Well, good afternoon. I'll go ahead and get started just for the interest of time. Uh, my name is Angeline Scotton. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, my job is to assist the public with conflict wildlife issues. And the number one species I talk to the public about in Pinellas County today are coyotes. So I have a short presentation to give to you really quickly to go over some coyote information. I'll start by saying coyote management in urban ecosystems is a complex complex and complicated issue, uh, one that I probably can't hit every topic on in the time allotted to me today. So I'm more than happy to come back and elaborate if needed um, at a later time. One of the top questions we get about coyotes is why are they in Florida? They didn't used to be here, and that's, there's some truth in that. They have uh, expanded their range naturally from the western U.S. to the eastern U.S. This map that I'm showing you now is a good graphic by decade, just how quickly they have been able to expand their range across the continent. You can find coyotes now in every, every state in the Union, with the exception of Hawaii. This is partially due to a couple of reasons. One is our conversion to an agricultural landscape across the country. The second reason is demise of predators. Uh, the society, human society wiped out a lot of predators for coyotes in the last 100, 150 years. Think wolves, bears, cougars, mountain lions. Um, without those predators in place, this also allowed coyotes to move from the western U.S. to the eastern U.S. I should point out that those same strategies that we used on wolves and bears and cougars were also done on coyotes. So they expanded their range while being heavily persecuted, which sound, which says a lot about their survivability and adaptability as a wildlife species in the area. For a little bit of biology about coyotes, uh, the coyotes are omnivorous, which means they're gonna eat just about anything. So they do rely a lot on plant material, but they will also eat things like rabbits and rodents and squirrels. They'll also take advantage of human-related foods like dog food, uh, bird seed, garbage, roadkill, um, fallen fruit, whatever they can find. This is why they do so well in urban areas because their diet is so eclectic and they can eat just about anything. They are highly adaptable. This is one of the most intelligent wildlife species that we have living in the area today. Adult coyotes are about the size of a mid-sized dog. They range in size from 25 to 40 pounds. In Florida, they're averaging about 27 pounds. Home range size is variable depending on where you are in the state. So if you're, let's say, East Polk County out in some ranch lands, they're gonna have a pretty large territory of about 15 square miles. But in an urban environment like Pinellas County, their territory gets really small. It's only about three square miles. The reason why it shrinks is because where there are humans, there's more food for coyotes. They don't need to patrol such a big area. They can find everything they need in a smaller space. And so in urban areas, you can potentially have denser coyote populations because their territory sizes are getting smaller with those human-related foods available to them. Coyotes mate in the winter, so we're in mating season right now. They have pups in the spring. Pups are on average about six pups in a litter, but this is dependent on food. The more food that's available to them, the more young they can support. So communities in Pinellas County can help can help with coyote reproduction by controlling their food. Human-related foods have high calories. That means coyotes can support more offspring. If they're not getting these human-related foods, they can't support as many offspring. Additionally, coyotes are monogamous. They mate for life. This is very unlike domestic dogs. Uh, domestic dogs have no pair bonds with each other, but coyotes do. They have very strong pair bonds. Uh, the male is involved raising his offspring, and that male and female make a commitment to raise their young together, and they remain monogamous in the territory throughout their lives, which is pretty interesting for a canine species. Hmm. The number one issue we have with coyotes in Pinellas County and most urban areas in the state is the fact that coyotes are urban and that there is pet loss associated with coyotes. Um, it is no secret coyotes are really good, unfortunately, at taking people's pets when they're free-ranging. Um, this is primarily cats that are left outdoors to free-range. They are absolutely open to predation anytime they're free-ranging. And while coyotes get the most notoriety for taking pets, I do want to point out there are other wildlife species in the area that will also take pets, like bobcats, like alligators, like large raptors. So it's not just coyotes, even though they get the most notoriety for it. Small dogs are typically also taken by coyotes. 
However, this is when small dogs are typically not secure. And by secure, I mean they're not on a leash, they're not in a well-functioned yard, they're not outside with a person. And typically when coyotes predate those dogs, it's a matter of opportunity. The little dog is outside by itself, it's not on a leash, it's not with somebody, coyote happens to be there, takes advantage of the opportunity. These are typically small dogs, by small I'm meaning under 20 pounds. Uh, we do have large dogs sometimes tangle with coyotes as well. These are typically large dogs that are off leash that are going up to a coyote's denning site that the coyotes are then defending. We also get a lot of questions about um, human safety. You know, are we safe around coyotes? And the answer to that is primarily yes. Uh, coyote attacks on humans in this country are pretty rare. And to put it into perspective, I have a uh, slide here showing you some statistics with dog attacks versus coyote attacks. So if we start with coyotes in this continent, in the US and Canada between 1970 and 2015, there's approximately nine attacks or bites by coyotes on people per year. This is typically someone who's doing something they shouldn't be doing, or like getting between the coyote and its food, or trying to give the coyote some food, like a hot dog or something, or it's a victim of someone doing something they shouldn't have been doing. In that same time frame, there have been two human fatalities caused by coyotes in the U.S. and Canada. Now, if you compare that to domestic dogs, there's more than 1,000 emergency room visits in this country every day from dog bites. There's more than 5 million cases a year that require medical treatment. And between 2013 and 2018, there were 217 recorded fatalities caused by domestic dogs in this country alone. So statistically, your chances of being bitten by a coyote, especially if you're doing all the right things, are fairly low. So what are the right things to do when coyotes are around? Uh, one is not to feed them. Um, anything that can attract a dog, a cat, or a raccoon can attract a coyote. So we're strongly encouraging residents to secure those food sources from coyotes and other wildlife, like garbage, keeping garbage secure in a, in a garage or a shed, uh, somewhere where the wildlife and coyotes can't get to it is a great thing to start with. And by trying, additionally with garbage, try to put it out on the morning of trash day instead of the night before. That'll give wildlife less opportunity to get into it. We also encourage cleaning up fallen fruit, pet food, and bird seed. These things are high in calories and it really pulls coyotes into urban communities. We're also suggesting that residents keep cats indoors. Uh, the risk, this is really the only way to keep them safe, not just from coyotes, but from other wildlife predation and from other perils that face them when they're free ranging outside. For small dogs, we suggest keeping them on short leashes, like a short six foot leash, not one of those retractables or the little dog can get way far away from you. Keeping them in a well fenced yard or supervised when they're outside. We also suggest to follow some hazing recommendations. This can be found on our website. Hazing is deterring coyotes, scaring them off, letting them know that they're not welcome in a community. And I'm gonna talk more about that here in just a moment. I wanted to bring you a local example today of a community that we've worked with here in Clearwater. And this is the on top of the world retirement community. We started hearing reports from them in 2018 that they had coyotes loafing on the golf courses, like <laughs> sleeping in the sand traps. We had photos of them doing that, uh, hanging out on the fairway, uh, where we had reports of them attacking dogs. We consistently heard that they were not afraid of people. And in this photo, in this slide, you can see a good example of that. We have golfers on the fairway here. We've got a coyote scratching himself not very far away, and nobody's really, nobody cares. Everybody's just kind of going along with their business. We did multiple site visits in this community with um, at Pinellas County Animal Services, and what we found was there was an at-large dog in this community that the residents were feeding. So we had a feeding situation in here while the residents were trying to help the dog um, and their heart was in the right place. They were also feeding the coyotes. Mm -hmm. We observed the dog and the coyotes moving across the apartment complex in the condos, approaching back doors, looking for food. So we had a feeding situation in here for sure. So what we did is we went into the community and we tested the coyotes. We kept hearing they weren't afraid of people. Uh, so what we did is we went and we hazed them to try to see what they would do. And they did the right thing. When they were approached by me personally and challenged, they yielded to me, which is exactly what they were supposed to do. So what we found is everybody was just really tolerant of each other. The coyotes really tolerant of the golfers and the residents, and the golfers and the residents were really tolerant of the coyotes. 
We did two education campaigns in On Top of the World, teaching residents to secure attractants to haze coyotes. Uh, we worked closely with the HOA board to, to make signs. If you see on the slide there, there's a photo of a sign that we worked really closely with their HOA on. That's now those signs are out throughout the community. I'm happy to report that as of my last check-in with On Top of the World, they're having no further issues with coyotes in their neighborhood, but we're standing by and ready to assist if they have further issues arise. Um, that is the end of my very short presentation. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes, for sure. Your um, thank you for that presentation. Just to use your speaker button. Oh, that didn't but, work. Go ahead. But once the meeting. Anyway, um, <laughs> this is the meeting. so so I've, we've heard that you know many people will ask us, um, well, why, why don't we just remove them and relocate them? And we've been told um, in the city that I from that, that that they'll produce more to offset those that have that they've lost is is there an issue is that true or what's the rationale for not necessarily relocating them that's right so when they are locally suppressed uh, they can increase their reproduction uh, so i'll try to give a good hypothetical example if all the coyotes in clearwater are removed like so let's say a trapper comes in or disease comes in and wipes them out all of a sudden, the coyotes in Largo will start increasing the reproductive output because now there's food and space available in clear water where there wasn't food and space before. So their reproductive output will increase. Uh, you'll have just as many coyotes in a few years than you, are, than you had before. Um, relocation really isn't the answer, and there's, there's really nowhere in the state of Florida you can take a coyote now where another coyote doesn't exist. Okay. Hmm. So you talked about hazing. What, what exactly do you do you do when you're confronting a coyote? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I forgot to answer that, so thank you. Hazing a coyote is basically giving it some negative attention, letting it know that it's not welcome in the area. With On Top of the World, all I did was walk towards it and yell at him, and that was enough to get him to move. Um, and we actually created a video. It's on our website. With an, it's about three minutes on how to haze coyotes. That entire video footage was taken in On Top of the World. Um, there are other things that residents can do besides yelling at them. They can use... Um, an air horn, they can throw rocks at them, they can use car horn, they can really do whatever it takes to man make the animal feel uncomfortable enough to where it le leaves the area and yields from human presence. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? Yes? Don't they usually yeah. run in packs, though? Yes and no. Uh, they are territorial, so when you see more than one coyote together, you're looking at them with their family group, so you're looking at the alpha male and female with their young of the year. And yes, they absolutely will travel together when they have young and teach them how to hunt. Um, and on top of the world, the particular days when we were out there, we saw three together. Um, my understanding was it was February, so I think what we were looking at there was an alpha male and female, one of their offspring from the previous year that had hung back to help them raise the pups from, from the <coughs> coming year. But yes, they will move together. Or Most of the time when people see them, it's one, uh, but you can see more than one together. They must be having a lot of babies in my area because we see them in multiple you know, groups. Time. What? Six at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Welch. <clears throat> um, you actually asked my question about hazing. Oh, okay. I don't see you. I know. I blew, I'm on the presentation, and if it doesn't right. show the, the yeah, do it from there. Um, may I? Yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're trying to electronically do everything Sorry. now, and so that's why we're poking a little funny at me. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the what about feral cats? As in, are they attractive to coyotes? Yes, feral cats are attractive to coyotes, not just the cats. It's also the food that's attractive to coyotes. So what we're finding is typically the food that's left for them, left for the cats, brings the coyotes in, and then the coyotes take advantage of the cats that are also there. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge draw, not just for coyotes, but for raccoons and other wildlife in the area, absolutely. So um, do, I mean, how about killing? coyotes killing the cats they do kill the cats yes uh -huh. they will consume the cat food and they will kill the feral cats as well okay All right um, do you track those in any way where the coyotes are versus feral cats you know that's a good question we I am not tracking any coyote reports necessarily in Florida other than where we're getting conflict calls and I think if we were to look at Pinellas County the map would probably be one big dot <laughs> uh -huh. um, I'm not familiar with where the feral cat colonies are in the county but we do often hear 
from community cat caretakers who are reporting loss from uh, the colonies of cats. One of the things we're trying to educate them on is not to leave food out indefinitely. Um, that's usually the draw for coyotes. So we're trying, if they absolutely must feed the cats, we're suggesting they feed the cats at one time of day and not leave the food out. And once the cats are done eating, pick up the food and, and leave the area. That will give wildlife less opportunity to come in and take advantage of those foods that are left there. But, but yes, the, to the underlying answer to your question is yes, they are killing the feral cats. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Seal, just Doug Brightwell, Animal Services. <clears throat> just as a follow-up to that part, that's why we have in the ordinance for all wildlife feeding. Feral cats that are in Pinellas County, they have a three-hour per 24-hour window that they can feed, and we recommend they do it at one time per day, and they have to remove the bowls and the food once the feeding time is up, just to minimize those nuisance issues. Okay. <coughs> I did Thank have you. a couple, Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, before you take off, I did have one for you, but is it Angeline? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. What's the average size of an adult coyote? Average weight is about 27 pounds in Florida. Okay. That's smaller than I thought. Yeah, yeah they, they look a lot larger yeah. than, they, than they are. Compared to a German Shepherd, it's like 80, 90? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And so, Doug, we get a call from a constituent, there's a coyote in their yard. Yes, sir. What do we tell them? We fall back to a lot of the information we get from FWC. Leave them alone, haze them, make them uncomfortable so they'll leave the yard. And we recommend people do yard checks to make sure that they don't have food or fruit or trash or any of that that's attracting the coyote. So it's okay to tell them to go yell at the coyote. It's safe to do that. Hey, we use the word hazing. You can yell at them. You can. We, a lot of people with dogs have the shake cans with the pennies in them that you use to, for dog nuisance issues. A and can with pennies in it's it. It's just a can with pennies okay. or rocks in it. It makes a noise, and that works well with the coyotes, mm -hmm. too. Okay. Okay. A lot of dog owners will have that if they're trying to train their own dogs okay. to get to deter bad behavior. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. So all the information that you have presented here is on your website and apparently more. Yes, we have a lot of information on coyotes on our website. I would say everything with the exception of the on top of the world information is on there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I haven't seen it yet. Hey. Get in there. Um, all right, next on the agenda is public comment. We have one card so far from David Ballard Geddes Jr. Hi, good afternoon. I'm David Ballard Geddes Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Not one measure, not one real effort to protect or conserve the remaining vital water supply from contamination. This government still today promotes the commercial use of pesticides that kills all the good things that live in the soil further together, poisoning our groundwater with fertilizers allows and creates. Our water supply is slowly becoming carcinogenic. Furthermore, this government still promotes the destruction of our God-given wetlands for the manufacturing of cypress mulch, knowing good and well that our wetlands serve as the liver of the earth and our wetlands are, are vital to the filtration and percolation of our water supply. Reducing our wetlands to thistles is an act of abomination. Even further, the lack of proper recycling of our garbage has caused our landfills to be filled with more contaminants than the world has ever known. The waste this government should have responsibly recycled and did not will continue to ruin our water supply for generations, coupled with the direct injecting of reclaimed water, disposing of our fecal waste directly into the aquifer, and the long-term nitrate burden associated with temporarily treated chlorinated fecal nitrates anaerobically introduced into our aquifer, bringing even further ruin, simultaneously aiding and abetting a third party, <clears throat> eminent domain taking of civilian owned property using the reclaimed water variance application under statute 15303 section five, staging us, setting us up on a water crisis that has and is still in the works built up on a legislative act of fee simple title usurpatuitous bulwark perniciously, rebelliously taking property, liberty, and life of the Gentiles claimed as process due under the 14th Amendment qualifies this government not as government,
but as an adversary seen as an actual invading force here to destroy the lives of our people as written in the Declaration of Independence, thereby subjecting the legitimacy of all stakeholdings throughout this government. Understanding this, I feel now is the time we need to make some corrections and adjust our bearings so that we can move forward on a civilized footing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda is the uh, consent agenda. Do we have anything that needs to be pulled? Low consent. Seven. Seven. Did it electronically. And so did I. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't hear anything over there. You want to say it and push the button? Say it and push it? Because we just pushed the button. Yeah. Um, I don't, actually don't see you on the speaker list here. No. No, we the motion. made the oh, motion. You motioned, yeah. you well, I was on the speaker it. to make the motion. <laughs> You just okay. went straight from motion. Yeah, we just wanted to do it as fast as we could. Okay, just hold on a second. Efficient side of the day. I was going to say that, but okay. Commissioner Eggers would like to say something, though. <laughs> no, simply was going to do what they did already, which is okay. make the motion. <laughs> okay, except we'll back up for a second because I should have said this before. Um, actually, I don't. When you have a thing down there that says motion. And now I can't see it. Current speaker. Because somebody's, I think, already made it. Because, yeah, I don't see. <coughs> Okay, forget it, because I don't see <laughs> I don't know where the vote is. You guys going. already did that. Um, there's nothing up here for me to say that. Okay, never mind. Um, Commissioner Justice, did you have something? I wanted to poll number seven. Yes, right. Okay, and Commissioner Long? No, I just wanted to see if you'd recognize me. <laughs> I, I know who you are. <laughs> I know, I just wanted to see if it worked. I'm so, practicing. Okay, so that didn't work. Um, you made the motion? I made the motion. She made the motion. Commissioner made Seal made the motion. Commissioner Welch seconded. I do have a question, though. Okay. So just um, going forward, do you want, when we make the motion, to do it verbally and push the button? Um, you're going to have to do it verbally because I'm not seeing anything so just that tells me that you did it. Okay. So we're not pushing buttons. Today. To vote. Unless to they motion. get it fixed motion. over there, no. Okay. Okay. Which is fine. Okay. Um, all right. I <laughs> think we'll take the voting thing. Oh, there. Okay, so how did you just do something different or did you enter those by hand? I think once we hit motion, it changes what you see. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see anything. No. <laughs> okay. But All there, right. But that there's was... nothing there that says somebody made the motion. Well, it's supposed to. I'm supposed to see what came up right before that. <coughs> so we can try it off off session. Yeah, we'll try it another time. Um, okay. That. Did you eventually see it? Right before, for right half a second before the voting so be ballot came up. Okay. We'll try it one more time. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was unanimous. Uh, item seven. Item seven is ranking of firms in an agreement with Stanton Consulting for conceptual facility planning and real estate financial consulting services. Um, as we have discussed, we have approximately 31 entities, 15 county administrative departments, constitutional officers, appointing authorities and agencies, over 1.4 million square feet. Um, and this will look at all of our space currently, what our um, planned needs are, and then begin to do financial analysis um, to determine what type of space we can plan for in the future. Uh, this will not just look at how many square feet, but the synergies between offices, you know, so should our financial, you know, office be connected <coughs> to this or should our permit functions be in a central location versus the five different locations or do we need a north and a south county to service our customers for functions. So it'll look at various pieces like that and come back with facility planning recommendations that we can use then for the next decade. So do you have questions about Yes, Madam Chair. Would you uh, push your button? Thank you. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and I apologize for not going into more depth on Thursday. I started to dig into the scope of work and everything. I just had a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. One, 
are we limiting the site selection to Clearwater, downtown Clearwater? I noticed in there it said county seat, but we've had reports that we, you know, what functions have to remain in the county seat, what don't. Um, and then I was interested in some of the properties that were excluded because we talked about, in one of the scope of work, it talked about the functions at 324 with the historic courthouse, but then it is not mentioned in one of the sites included for evaluation. Um, and also, we excluded the site that we own on Ulmerton Road with the fleet maintenance building or property. So I was just kind of trying to get a feel for why we made some of those decisions about what properties we were going to evaluate and not, and the functions in the historic courthouse versus... So anyway, I just want to get some more clarity on that. So the location, the location decisions will come at a later date because first I need to understand the array of services. For instance, when we have a central um, county administrator, commissioner functions, that may have security associated with it. When we have human services, it, we would not want necessarily that to be in the same building, people being comfortable coming into a central government facility or maybe a permit center. Um, would You know, you'd want that as a standalone. So, sir, so first we have to determine the types of functions that we provide, what types of facilities would service those functions. Then we can talk about location. So, um, well, that, that goes to my sec a second question would be, are we, are we going to have decision points throughout the process or is this going to come back and give us 38 different options? And I, I guess the question is, I don't want us to have a report come back to us in a year that we've spent a lot of time and resources on mm -hmm. that is limited in evaluating our potential, I guess. A little bit hard to, to explain because I don't know where they're going to go with that, right? Um, but I think the it's got to be an iterative process to working with you. Um, but <coughs> I think some of that will be determined on what types of locations. Certainly, uh, locations of sites will be a big consideration. But part of that would go into understanding where they would recommend best to locate that to serve the customer needs. And that may be different for different types of sites. Certainly, there's a piece that involves being in the county seat for the central administrative functions, um, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't preclude that. But there would be other steps involved if that was a decision we made. So I guess it, uh, my, then the question would be if if they've determined we need X thousand square feet in these three sites, three different, or could be potentially three different sites with constitutionals, the permitting and the administrative functions, and they're looking at real estate values and they're all of those kind of things I see in the scope of work. Are they are they going to evaluate countywide about the site potentials for those different services? I think that'd be left to our direction on how we want them to proceed in those particular areas. So they're going to be they're going to be uh, having those conversations with you and your staff throughout the whole process, as far as correct. You, you understand what I'm saying? I don't want it to come back and say, "Here's your three. Here's the no. best recommendation." And then we find out, well, there was a site in just across the city line in Largo that we really should have looked at. That's I guess that's you know I, I, I don't think... want our choices limited down the road. No, I, th I think it's going to provide a array of um, options for us. So, you know, I see this at the end of this. It may take us 10 years, you know, to build that out. But currently, a, a particular area says, I want to renovate this building. And I go, well, I don't even know if, if that's a good investment because should we really not renovate but co-locate co functions and have, have better customer service? And so this would give us a planning tool to be able to make some of those follow-on decisions um, based upon all those different factors that go into it. All right. I just, I mean, I fully support yeah. doing this. We, did, we It's long overdue. I just want to make sure that when they come back with a report and they give us, we're going on the options they've offered us, and it's limited. That's, that's my only concern in the whole process. Well, and I guess I want to go back to your original question. Why aren't all the properties involved? It, <laughs> well, I didn't know about, I knew about the parks. I didn't know about the, um, the facilities um, or the, the fleet. Parks is, we're going to be looking at that campus um, because we have different um, 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 uh, tenants on that campus. So that would be a separate review that we're going to do for the parks area. If it was determined that permitting the most activity was around Ulmerton Road, it would be interesting, you know, if we're just kind of doing a blank slate evaluation here. Uh, and I, I think I think permitting is a is a particular one where we're going to have to understand customer needs. Right. right. That's, right. that's one that's going to be very customer driven, uh, where our customers coming from, um, and so I think that would have less limiting factor on location than let's say this building. This building, if you said you want to go, you know, outside of Clearwater, that would require um, a different uh, pathway to get there. 
Yes, please. Joe Lower Administrative Services. Fleet is actually item 22 on the bill as we are going to look at. It's 9685, Almaty is actually included in the study. Fleet, fleet management is. I thought I saw it listed as an excluded was property. Part you I were think looking it was at? originally. Yeah. Okay. Then in regards, Andrew Pupke, uh, Facilities and Real Property Division Director, Administrative Services, for 324 for the courthouse. Our rationale there was if the court's functions moved from this campus, including the court functions within this building, that building would still remain because it is a historic building, but we would have to take into account the court functions that currently reside there. Right, and I didn't, and maybe it was in the addendum and not the original scope of work, but I thought I saw 324, the functions there, but as far as the actual building, it wasn't listed as far as the other, like this was designated 315 and the one up on Fort Harrison, but that one was not designated in the original scope of work that I was looking at. Right, so we, quite likely, as I mentioned, that building would remain. Those other two buildings, I mentioned 315, this building and the annex would go away. But that building, because of its historic significance, would stay. The but the functions p could potentially functions change in that move. building. They could. I mean, if, if we if we had a new court facility somewhere in mm -hmm. North County, correct. it's only got four courtrooms, really only two judges right. that are using it, right. that mm -hmm. you could move them those judges and those functions somewhere else and put something completely different exactly. in the historic mm -hmm. courthouse. Exactly. And then as far as the other uh, departments or campuses, we have other activities that are going on at those locations, such as the Public Works campus. We have a master plan consideration for that. Uh, we didn't look at emergency management because they're in the public safety campus already. Uh, we have the GMD locations for utilities not included because they are separate and then they are generally related to the plant functions. We are looking at 14 South Fort Harrison and the functions that both utilities and the other entities have in that building. Solid waste because it again is unto itself and operates singularly for that purpose was not considered as part of this. And then we did not include the airport because again they're doing their own master planning at the airport as well. Commissioner Eggers. <clears throat> well, yeah, thank you uh, for pulling this, Commissioner Justice. Um, yeah, I think this is a really complicated uh, process, um, and it's certainly obviously understanding uh, the inventory of real estate and buildings that we have. We already have that information. I'm assuming these folks ultimately will be intimately familiar with that, because as we decide, as we discuss with commission um, policies that dictate some of it, uh, talk to our residents and our contractors and get input from the public, that's going to get thrown in the mix. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that there's going to be a, a pretty, I hope, robust interactive process with the public, with staff, your, your, all your different staff, and, and us. So there's, that's going to be ongoing um, yes. as you start to pull all this together. And then talking about the, the piece about using the properties that we have in some in some capacity before we decide to dispose of a property mm -hmm. or how to renovate a property for a different use mm -hmm. again these are all these are all extremely you know complicated and but i think that we don't want to get too far down a road before we start looking at stuff i think it's an iterative process i think is really so we can start to see where it's heading and mm -hmm. kind of get a feel for it in, in some regards and give some direction and then mm -hmm. funnel that back so that we're not going down a path too far and then we've wasted three years and we're like, what? Wait, wait a minute, let's back up and, sure. and go in a different direction. So I think that's going to be really important. We've discussed uh, that previously yeah. with the administrator and that's his, been his yeah. direction to us, so that's how we'll proceed with the study. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. The um, spreadsheet you're referring to that has all the buildings and mm -hmm. square footage, do you have something like that that also has the yes, current okay. functions at those buildings? I'm sure we can come up with a commission. If it's not actually it, part of this, this okay. scope of work, we can come up with it. If it's not a whole lot of work, I think that would add yeah. to yeah. understanding sure. what's out there. Yeah, and it, the building that's the second largest, 9685 Wilmerton, is that? That's, yes, that's, fleet. Fleet. that's fleet. fleet management. That's a fleet. That's yeah. fleet. Okay. Yes, yeah. All right. Thank you. Did you want <laughs> yes, I pressed the button again. Right. The and so you can look at for uh, the page that I was referencing is page 18 of 45 on the section E scope of work, section G exclusions inclusions, 
And it talks include 315, 400, 440, 310, but doesn't mention 324, uh, Fort Harris, which is the old courthouse. And you would need to have those functions evaluated as part of the master plan. Right. And then also on page 19 at the end of that list, number 14 is exclude the fleet management location. So that's where I got that information from as well. Understood. Mm -hmm. And in some situations, we're also doing assessments of the buildings in most of the, the situations. In fact, 324 would be an exception because if that building is going to remain regardless, we wouldn't do a building assessment as we would here to determine whether this was the best decision was to keep this building and renovate it or to build a new building. Well, again, not to completely muddy it, but what if the determination, again, with those court functions, limited as they are, were to go somewhere else and that you wanted to use that historic building for something else? Um, it, it could be an administration commission facility, for example, just throwing not starting something, just throwing something idea out there, sure. <laughs> that if you wanted to maintain a presence in downtown Clearwater, but the best place for permitting and everything else was eight blocks that way or eight blocks that way, sure. we would still have a presence and it's still limited, but it wouldn't be limited to those just four courtrooms. And again, really just two judges and some magistrates that come there. Right. Um, again, I just don't want to limit us from thinking what could be some really neat ideas out there for our space use and our functions? The reason, the reason it took us a long time to bring this back to you, because we've been talking about this for a very long time, is because we went back out because we wanted this to be operational, not, you know, an architect. We wanted this to understand the functionality of the, of the space and that we're building space around the way we want to operate and, and the synergies necessary to maximize customer service, access, and efficiency. And so that took us longer and required us to come back out. And so that's the exact purpose of this study. So then one last question. Since, um, sorry, I'm channeling Commissioner Eggers today. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> so isn't that function, that evaluation is, and looking at real estate values is, you know, and let's say there is a boom in downtown Clearwater, similar to what's happening in downtown St. Pete in five years, and we're going through this process. It, it really would be best to sell three of the four buildings in downtown and move eight blocks east. That evaluation of the real estate values and everything will be taken into the process. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Welch. Commissioner Eggers, when you were making appointments this November, I'm sure you remember that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's at the bottom of the list. <laughs> Just notice. Let me give you um, a <laughs> That same sheet. Just what's the reason that for 315 Court Street there's a number above the line and then also number 26 and the same thing with 501? Why are those broken out? Subtotal. People get yeah, it's garages. Hey, people. Garage space. Garages are the ones below the subtotal? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But even on, your, even on your list, you can see, I mean, we own, you know, 520 Oak. It's a little house we have over here. We have hmm. little bits of houses from an efficiency standpoint. We really need to look at how we've kind of spread out over the years. Okay. Any more questions? Entertain a motion to approve. Um, you can try that. using that. Did. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Don't see it. Well, that's the problem. You're not. Wait a second. Wait a second. I'm on it. I had to get out before you can say that. Oh. Okay. Move. <laughs> Motion by Commissioner Eggers, second by Commissioner Welch, and we are ready. Okay. That is unanimous. Phew. Item, um, where are we? What, 12? Yes. Okay, item 12 is the Second Amendment to the Maintenance and Management Agreement with Palm Harbor Community Services Agency for Palm Stansel Park. Again, this follows the Commissioner's direction um, for maintenance agreements with these uh, facilities. Move approval. Oh. Okay, oops. Motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Eggers. We're ready to vote. Yeah, look how easy that was. <laughs> Thank you. I don't ever have to look at you guys again. <laughs> um, wow. wow. Just kidding. Wow. Did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Me? Yeah, you have Not your... at all. Okay, never mind. She doesn't want to speak. Item 13. 
This is a grant award from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, this is for the second um, budget year for uh, a grant that provides mobile medical unit and Bayside Clinic for 2,951 homeless clients. Uh, this is $1.5 million. Total anticipated expenditure is $2.7 million. Okay. So I made the motion, Madam Chair. I made the second. Right. Okay. Um, doesn't she announce it? Does that count? I'm sorry? Because she announces it, that doesn't count for the verbal record? My instruction, but yeah, that, that's how we have done it over the years. So. Okay, the problem, though, is that she announces that she moved, but he pressed his button first. Right, which is why if they verbally say I press the button, you know, I'm making a motion, then that we have both of those on the record and we can see why there's a match. Without the verbal But if there's not a if, if you if you see that on, uh, in electronic and you can say motion by, second by, and that creates your, your verbal record. Well that's what I did so or okay. that's what I yes. will do. Okay. See I ignored her when she said I moved because she hadn't pressed her button, right? <laughs> so, okay. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Nothing yeah. else to know. So. It's like Jeffrey, you gotta okay. And they don't need to announce, do they need to announce, Norm? I would have to defer. Uh, if you at least announce. I will announce before we get the voting thing up. She right, then the, the, we'll nice. record that as the record, what you announce. That's what I was hoping for, yes. Thank you. Okay. We, we, yep. Well, question ahead. real quick. I think in addition to that, I think it's important that we we say it because I may be m making a motion to deny. So it's not just a motion to accept. So we don't I think have so. That. If I push the button, I say I move to deny. Uh, so I'm not this case. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. In general, so I think it's important that whoever's making the motion also verbalizes what it is they're motioning. So. Yeah, but it's still not going to coincide with that then. So. Is there a way to fix that, or do we just scrap the whole if darn thing? Make a motion to deny, we can I know you can change it. Thank you. But how do you know who? <laughs> do we want to practice this off site? Yeah, I hear you. I, I thought we had it all worked <laughs> I out. I thought so too. <laughs> sure. Um, Let's just do verbal motions for now. We'll talk about this later. Okay, for this one, we have a motion by Commissioner Welch, <laughs> second by Commissioner Peters, and we're ready. That is unanimous. Item 14. This is a resolution affirming the policies of the Pinellas County Comprehensive Plan, including the East Lake overlay that restricts density to the north portion uh, of this area to 0.5 units per acre and formally requesting the Pinellas County um, or the Pinellas Planning Council to add a residential rural, which is 0.5 units per acre land use map category to the countywide uh, plan rules. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Eggers, second by Commissioner Welch. Do we have any comments, questions? All right, we're ready to vote. Okay, that is unanimous. Item 15. This request approval of a county incentive grant um, program agreement with Florida Department of Transportation for construction of an ATMS system on 49th Street. Uh, the department agrees to fund a maximum of $1.5 million, which is 50% of the estimated cost. Move approve. Move to approve. <clears throat> I'm sorry, did she? Peters, did you move? Seal. Oh. Commissioner Seal. Moved by Commissioner Seal, seconded by Commissioner Long. I have a question though. Um, which is County Road 611? 49th Street. 49th Street. Yeah, but 49th Street doesn't go. Oh, yes, it does. Never mind. All the way. <laughs> it connects all the way. All the way. Never mind. I've driven every inch of it many times. Never mind. <laughs> all right. We're ready then. Somebody missing, thank you. 
All right, that is unanimous. Item 16. This is a uh, Florida Department of Environmental Protection grant subrecipient agreement between the county and the city of Dunedin for funding for the Lofty Pine Septic to Sewer Project in unincorporated Pinellas County. Uh, this grant funds um, um, $500,000 with no county match. The county act will act as a pass-through for the grant, which will provide sanitary sewer collection for 120 residents. The city will contribute $1.6 million towards the project. We'll have approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Peters, second from <coughs> Commissioner Justice, and we're ready. That is unanimous. Item 17. This is the matching um, grant. The, the first one was between the county and the city, and this is between us and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Second. There we have a motion from Commissioner Peters, second from Commissioner Justice, and we are ready to vote. Somebody's missing. Okay, that is unanimous. Oh, oops. <laughs> Item uh, 18, sorry. This is the First Amendment to an agreement with Garnery Companies um, for the design build services for the new head works and grit removal facility at the, Cross, at the South Cross Bay Water Reclamation Facility. Uh, as part of the first uh, phase, it was a $2.4 million design, and the second phase is a construction of $2.4 million, bringing the project total to just over two, uh, $27 million. Move approval. Second. Uh, Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Welch. We have a question. What? Yeah, I hit the button just for the record. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I just wanted to. Uh, this was um, this is a big dollar amount, so I'm assuming that um, uh, in the proposal that we saw last week that uh, showed wastewater rates increasing significantly and water rates not significantly. Part of that reason was this continued commitment to capital. At this location, among others, that's correct. And Ivy, yes. go ahead. Yes, I, I don't know if you want me up here. Yeah, you that, want to yeah. address that as well. But I'm Ivy Drexler. I'm the plant manager for the South Cross Bayou facility, and I'm here to stand in for Megan Ross for today. Okay. So, um, if you could repeat your question. Now, so please. last week we talked about our wastewater rates going up significantly over the next three years. I think it's nine percent a year. Okay. I'm assuming it's because of a heavy capital investment in the wastewater arena, and it includes things like this. But I didn't know if this was part of that package. It, it, it was part of that package. Raheem is, is certainly here. I think it's probably out outside of your oh, wheelhouse. Yes. Uh, okay. but, um, but that's absolutely part of the capital program and the, re and the reason for the rate increases. I think that's important that we keep s drawing that connection so that when we do come to the point of raising rates and people are scratching their heads, at least we've had that continued conversation about why. Yeah, it was at the, the rate was heavily cap capital construction and environmental protection re uh, regulatory requirements. Driven. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. We're ready to take a vote. That is unanimous. Item 19. Under 19, we are, I am requesting your approval of staff's recommendation in the confidential memorandum of today's date. Approval. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Welch. We're ready for questions. And it's unanimous, item 19. Under uh, item 20, we are asking <laughs> your approval to uh, initiate litigation. Um, in this case, this is a matter that was investigated by your Office of Human Rights. The claim was housing discrimination. Move approval. Second. second. <clears throat> uh, motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Welch. And that is unanimous. Item 21. Under item 21, we're requesting your approval to uh, file suit in the referenced matter. This is a code enforcement matter uh, involving some accumulation and trash and some other zoning violations. Move approval. Second. 
Uh, motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Welch. That is unanimous. Do you have anything else? I do not. Okay. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, Administrator? I have one report, and um, I was very pleased uh, Commissioner Gerard uh, joined me um, yeah. on February the 17th for in-service day. Um, on in-service day, there's a lot of training and things that go on that people don't see, but she got to witness firsthand as we visited different uh, wastewater treatment and water uh, treatment facilities of the emergency planning that they were doing to train up on if things happen. And people were literally oper exercising their operational plans, uh, preparing for what happens in a hurricane. They were put into real life situations of you had a, everything from um, of, of being able to have power outages at lift stations and things like that to chlorine leaks um, because of hurricane. What do you do with the surrounding neighborhood? And all of the various emergency planning that goes into keeping our residents safe and our environment protected. Uh, those were exercised in the utilities department on February the 17th, our in-service day, and so I just wanted to report on what I thought was just a fantastic exercise, um, but really making, um, you know, real preparation work uh, for disasters and making sure we're ready. Yes, and you should feel good about what will happen when we have the next disaster. They are ready. I have. Okay. Uh, Next on the agenda is appointment to the Torch Development Council. I have ballots here that have your names on them, so please take the right one. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I that think says I'll... Eggers. <laughs> and you vote for one in either category. One in either category. Right. Thank you. Oh, that's ridiculous. Pictures. Not yet. I wanted to look at one. Make sure. Okay. Just waiting for Commissioner Welch. Tabulate those. We have more. Do we have any new business items from the commission? I do have one item, Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Um, well, two. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Justice for joining me at the Urban League Whitney um, Young Whitney M Young Empowerment Luncheon uh, last Friday. I want to congratulate uh, Carol Alexander from the Next Step Pregnancy Center. Gina Proquet from Academy Prep and Lorna Taylor for being recognized for their community service and their work for diversity. I also wanted to uh, mention that in two weeks, the U.S. Census mm -hmm. will start to send out uh, notifications in the mail. Uh, again, our staff has done a, a killer job. There's some new uh, flyers that will be going out. They've uh, actually got a new link to the website. So just want to remind folks that the census will ask for the number of people at your address name, sex, age, and race, ethnicity of people in your home, and will ask if you own or rent. The census will not ask for your social security number, it will not ask your citizenship status, and the census will not come from any political party. It will not say Republican or Democrat on anything that you get about the census. So I just want folks to be aware that that is coming. For more information, uh, you can go to uh, our new link, www.pinellas census.org and hope everyone will participate and make the Nellis count. I have a question about yeah. census. Will they still have like a certain percentage of people do a longer form? Remember I don't, they, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but we'll get the answer to that okay. for you. 
Yes. Mr. Just Rogers. real quick, I, I just wanted to say um, to those who were there that you all know already, but there's several others that didn't go to the uh, Blue Jays opening day yesterday, and it was a it was really a magnificent day. They did a great job with the stadium, um, and the day was beautiful, and it was full, and uh, there's a lot of energy. Um, I think, as importantly, the um, when we did the, the deal with the Blue Jays originally, um, they, they, they were a 25% uh, investor in the deal, but there was also the possibility of going over on their, uh, their construction costs, and we knew that. Um, and it was all going to fall on the Jays. So just so everybody knows that in the end, the Blue Jays are probably the largest contributor of funds with about $43 million of the now $102 million project. Ours didn't change from the original. Um, and the counties and the cities did not change. But I thought it was really important to just let folks know that um, the Jays are there at the table, probably for between 40 and 45 percent of the uh, of the deal, which is really a good thing and probably something that uh, should be a a, rule of thumb. Um, a, a, a good uh, a good uh, example for others. Um, the only other thing I was going to say is that. Um, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Jerry Custon, who we all know mm -hmm. and love, is very involved in so many different things, uh, leading Memorial Day services at Curlew Hills and Veterans Day services. Um, now he's in involved with the Veterans Engagement Board and um, all over the manufacturing industry and working with Oldsmar, uh, the city of Oldsmar and the chamber there. Um, he had, they had a retirement party for him last night, uh, and it was just really well attended, uh, probably, I don't know, 100, 100 plus people that were in attendance and saying some really nice things. As it turns out, he's officially retiring, but he's going to be very involved in probably just as many things. Manufacturing, he's going to be involved with uh, um, Congressman Belarakis's office. He's going to be involved in still with different aspects of the Veterans Engagement Board. So he's still going to be very busy, but probably just in a little different role. And uh, we just wanted to wish him all the happiness and good luck in the next phase. That's all I have. Thank you. I wanted to thank Commissioner Eggers for saving me from throwing out the first pitch. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, you would have done thank just fine. You, know, no, I, I, you would have done just not fine. Not willing to find up, out again. Thank you. Stacked up against the mayor, you would have been fine. So, anybody else? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I just wanted to share. There. What? Nothing. I just wanted to share with all of you that I had an opportunity to tour the Seminole Dredge today, this morning, and if you haven't been out there and seen it up close and personal, it is pretty remarkable what they're doing, how much they're doing, and I learned some new terms today, which I just am going to love talking to people about, because we were able to see the polishing of the water and how it comes from the bottom of the lake and goes through this whole system. And then you have polished water, and it's just the most lovely, beautiful, gurgling little brook. Like you'd see up north or out west somewhere with rocks, and the water is so clean and pure, and I just got the biggest kick out of that. Secondly, uh, we were able to go on the dredge barge, and I had just such a neat time talking to this young man who I couldn't help but say to him, how old are you? And he was 18. Right. Today was his first day at work. And I said, oh, my goodness, bless your little heart. What on earth would cause you to be interested in this kind of work? And he said, my dad, because I'm having to save my money to pay for college. <laughs> I just thought that was such a neat little story. And then the other uh, person that I spoke with when we got out by the burn took us into this, um, I don't know what you call it, but anyway, they had a computer in there where they're monitoring on the computer every single thing that's going on and how fast it's going on and how much it's doing and all of the polymers and stuff that are going in the water. And I said to that young man, well, how did you come to be doing what you're doing here today? And he talked about how he was uh, with the company for five years, but he had become an engineering tech. This reminded me of that presentation we had from Dr. Williams from the college about all the different certifications they had there and how 
he is now working his way into becoming an engineer by the work that he's doing there. And I just thought, oh, I've got to tell all my colleagues, this is such a great opportunity great. for young people to work on things that they never could have ever dreamed about. And um, it's just, it's, um, it made me so proud that Pinellas County is so ahead of the curve in terms of the technology <coughs> and the newest and greatest things that are going on to do this kind of work. And it is amazing when you get up on top of that burn. I don't know when the last time was that you were out there, but even Kelly was astounded at how much more they had taken out of the bottom of the lake. And it reminds you when you look at it, for those of you who have been down to the reservoir for Tampa Bay water, looks just like that. It's unbelievable. Anyway, that's my story and I just thought I'd share. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, and one more thing. I'd like to extend congratulations to Tim Nickens at the St. Pete Times on his retirement. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all probably going to really miss his thoughtful and um, wise editorials that he writes every day. So anyway, that's the end of my whatever story today. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have a verdict? Yes, we do. We have um, five votes for um, Mike Williams, uh, one vote for Laura T. Hine, and one vote for Alan P. Johnson. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Williams is the gentleman from Innisburg. Correct. So, yes. I had one other quick follow-up. Go for it. Our uh, elite uh, marketing team already has the answer to your question, so everyone will get the same form. Oh. For the census, there there is a, a long form called the American Community Survey that comes out in between the census, but, oh, okay. but that's a long form you're a, thinking okay. about. The other thing that I forgot to mention, I wanted to give kudos to Jade Spradley of the Urban League Young Professionals. They did an outstanding video on the census that played at the luncheon last Friday, and I'm going to share that on my social media as well. So I just want to thank Jade for her great work. Thank you. And we should all share it as well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Great. Well, maybe you should bring it here and show. I didn't want Jewel to start asking questions about it, so. Okay. <laughs> we'll send it to her first. All right. All right. Fine. Okay. I, uh, that was Commissioner Walsh. There's nobody else on the. Okay. We are adjourned for. Three hours. Almost three hours. Okay.